All right, can everybody see what I'm doing? Yep. All right. So, actually, we have... a presentation to run through really quick here on this one so weather observations kind of important um, right kind of something that we should probably know and understand pretty well due to the fact that most of our jobs once we become <laughs> dispatchers about 80 percent of our job is weather related or ties into weather so need to learn our weather reports okay so METARs, METARs being the primary observation, right? So observations means this is the field conditions that are currently happening. What's happening over any air uh, airport at any given time, we need to know so that we can see trends, we can see, you know, ceiling levels, all that information, winds, temperature, and dew point. We need to know what's going on at our airports because if it's not safe and we've got an airplane that's 30 minutes out, we need to be looking for somewhere that he can go, right? So METARs, you guys need to memorize that METARs are an hourly report. It is distributed hourly, updated hourly, okay? There's three types of reporting systems that that uh, that will write these METARs, and two of them are automated. One is a weather obs uh, weather observer. Okay, so AWOS, ASOS, those are our two automated. A weather observer is somebody that's been trained in meteorology that will actually go out and. Uh, They'll go out, they'll write a report on what the weather's doing. Okay, they lick their fingers, stick it up in the air, see which way the wind's coming from. They go, oh, that's about five knots. No, just teasing. It's, but they do, they do take accurate measurements. And um, what's kind of interesting is there's some airports that have a permanent weather observer on site. Uh, during the regular shift um, and be, that's due to the fact that they're kind of we call them outstations so we'll call up these outstations we'll say hey your METAR is not reporting this or this or this and they'll say oh yeah um, well it's currently raining and then we'll put that into the report and we can send it because we got it over a recorded line can send it to the pilot well this is what the weather observer said so <clears throat> we can take reports from them as well okay other observations pi reps okay so we get a lot of information from air mets and sig mets now an air met as we're going to learn very shortly here an air met is a um, basically a, a warning for for pilots saying, hey, you're going to experience turbulence in this area, or there's mountain obscuration along here, or any any number of hazards that we might occur as pilots. Well, those are very general and very broad warnings. Um, I'll show you what an air mat looks like later on. But an air mat doesn't mean, or a sig mat, don't necessarily mean anything 
until we have a pilot report or a METAR or some other backup to support what the AirMet and SIGMET are saying. So PIREPS, and you need to write this down too, PIREPS stands for pilot report. Okay, so these are written by pilots or dispatchers or air traffic control. And um, what they are are observations of current conditions outside. Okay, so just as an example, when I uh, started dispatching out on the floor, it was a really, really bad day in Washington, D.C., and uh, over Dulles, and um, we had like some really huge gusts. I think it hits, it peaked out at about 70 knots at one point, and they actually evacuated the air traffic control tower um, due to hazards of being up, you know, if the tower goes down, we don't want our people in it kind of thing, you know. So, <clears throat> Anyways, I had an airplane that was flying into there, and I got, um, he was about an hour and a half out, and I got a message from another dispatcher, and they told me, hey, look, um, I just got a report from my pilot that say, uh, stated that on the approach into Dulles International, um, almost all the passengers threw up. Um, due to turbulence and I was like oh cool thanks well come to find out just a few minutes later I get a pirate that pops up over Dulles and she submitted it and hey, there was a question Garrett um, oh yeah Christian was asking how long do pirates appear for and did they have an expired time yeah so pilots are about 30 minutes or pirates are 30 minutes unless supported by another PIREP. So basically every 30 minutes it has to be updated. Um, most of the time what happens is a PIREP um, gets written by a pilot or reported by a pilot and then it just expires 30 minutes later. Does that make sense? So essentially, if it's not updated within 30 minutes, you can ignore it. Otherwise, it just expires. It, it just disappears off of your. Gotcha. So. Anyways, this PIREP gets issued, and it pops up, and the PIREP actually says, pilot reported severe turbulence on approach. Nearly all the passengers threw up. Okay. In fact, there it is right there. So let me zoom in here. <sighs> oh, Lord almighty. So anyways. This gets submitted by the dispatcher. You can see right here, coming into Dulles, time 1238 Zulu, flight level 4,000 feet. Type was a CRJ200. Turbulence moderate to severe. Remark, very bumpy on descent. Pretty much everyone on the plane threw up. Pilots were on the verge of throwing up. Sure, it uh, was a <laughs> wonderful, nice smelling situation to be in. Yeah. And I started busting up laughing. I was just like, why would you put that in the pirate? Like moderate to severe turbulence is plenty. You don't need to go into details of, of what was going on. So anyways, all of a sudden, the OCC starts getting calls from all kinds of news agencies to report on what's, you know, what's going on. They want to... They want to be the first ones to report about this vomit comet that just landed at Dulles International that was submitted by our... Oh, did it really get that nickname? Because that is amazing. Yeah. So, anyways... The vomit comet. Oh. Yeah. So, 
they pulled her in and they lit her up for for writing that in the remarks section. <laughs> said, well, they didn't light her up. They just said, hey, it's not really necessary and we need to be more professional. You've caused us a whole lot of headaches. So, <laughs> anyways, it was a funny story that uh, that happened to me. So, had to share. That's what I always talk about when I get pirates. I was waiting for the one where everybody crapped their pants and it got reported. Oh my gosh, that's horrible. Yeah, it's a. Uh, it's funny what the news agencies, how quick that spreads, you know? So, yeah, when you're writing these reports, you will as dispatchers, you'll take like an ACARS message that the pilot sends you. And what I usually do is I, I ask the pilot, would you like to submit a report? Um, when he tells me, hey, turbulence at this level, you know, I'll just say, hey, would you like me to submit a report? And then he'll say yes or no. And if he says yes or no, I do accordingly, right? I just copy and paste basically what he said, put it in there, and then submit it uh, so that it can be displayed for everybody else. But sometimes the pilots are just kind of like BSing with you and having fun. And so don't don't just like throw stuff like that in there because you don't know what actually happened on the aircraft. So they were probably exaggerating quite a bit, but then they had all these new news agencies that were calling pilots up and calling anybody that would talk to them about it. So caused a pretty big headache for management. Anyways, so these radar weather reports, we typically don't see these. I, I've never really actually looked at one, so, um, but it is another source of observation. So the main ones that you'll use for observations, meaning current conditions outside, are going to be METARs and PIREPs, okay? So, um, these forecasts, TAF. You need to memorize that a TAF is a forecast that is um, its regular scheduled time of issuance, I guess you could say, is four times a day um, or every six hours. Okay. So the scheduled TAF times. Um, and you need to memorize this as well. Scheduled TAF times are 00, 06, 12, and 18 Zulu. Okay. Um, now, let's kind of talk about METARs and, and TAFs. Okay, so METARs, remember, are the current observations over the airport. TAFs are forecasts for the next 24 to 30 hours over that same airport. Okay, so you'll have a METAR and a TAF for the same airport. Now, METARs and TAFs, even though it says hourly and four times a day, that doesn't mean that those are the only times that those are submitted. Okay. METARs, and you'll want to write this down. METARs have what are called species, and a species is any time there's a significant change in one of the five required items, um, a species is an update to the METAR, okay? So typically airports will update their um, METARs you know, at the 50, 51, 52, or 53, or 54, or 55, or 56 after the hour. Um, very rarely do you see airports that update on the, on the dot, on the hour. Um, typically, it's about 
within the last 10 minutes of the hour that they update the, the METAR. Um, and TAFs, just because their regularly scheduled TAF release time is 0006, 12, and 18, sometimes we have what's called an amended TAF, which is a change in the forecast, right? Because weathermen get it wrong all the time. I mean, they're shooting like a good weatherman shoots about 60 to 70 percent, right? He's, he's right only about 60 to 70 percent of the time. So as these updates or changes come out, if it's like drastic enough of a, a difference from the original issuance, then they'll go in and do a TAF amendment and update the forecasts. Does that make sense? So let's take a look at a METAR and a TAP really quick. Yeah, the weather will be almost the same. Let's see. So here's our TAFs and our METARs. Okay, so Salt Lake City, and we're going to learn how to read these, but Salt Lake City is the identifier of the airport. Notice that the K prior to the um, city code, okay, this K, this is what we call the ICAO code for um, airports. And when you go in to work for an airline, you're going to um, get a list of all the airports that your airline flies to. And you're going to have to memorize the city code, most likely. But if you're ever curious, you can see the city codes right here. Now, the K indicates that it's part of the 48 contiguous states. A P indicates that it's either Alaska or Hawaii. A C is Canada. An M is Mexico. And then the rest, Lord knows. I don't know. I honestly, I, I wish I knew better. But... Um, I don't know a lot of the country codes, um, but the country is indicated with the with the first of the four letters, and then the city code is the following three. So K S L C would be Salt Lake City International. K S G U would be St George Regional. P A B D is uh, Valdez Airport or Pioneer Field in Valdez, Alaska. PHNO, I believe it is, is Honolulu, Hawaii. Oh, PHNL. I was way off there. So. Anyways, you guys get the uh, get the idea behind airport codes, right? Uh, VORs, which are navigational radio systems on the ground, also have a very similar. It's just a three-letter identifier. They drop the K for the for the ground-based navigational aid. So you'll see both, and we'll we'll go into it a little bit more, but. Anyways, so city code, then it gives you the time that uh, the TAF was issued in Zulu. So it's already the 14th um, in Zulu time. And Zulu time is 
uh, off of Greenwich Mean Time. So off the clock in Greenwich, England, right? A zero, zero on the time scale or whatever. Zero, zero, 0054 Zulu. Okay, so it's 12.54 in the morning on the 14th. The next part is your winds. The first three digits are your wind direction. The second two digits are your wind speed. Okay. KT stands for knots. This is your visibility, 10 statute miles. Statute miles are what we would call like standard miles in uh, the US. So miles per hour, statute miles, There, that's what it's based off of is that one mile is one mile. Now, if we talk about nautical miles, nautical mile is 1.17 miles per one nautical mile. Okay. So METARs, are all, METARs and TAFs are always written in statute miles. Now, that's statute, not statue or standard, but statute miles. This is what we call the sky condition, okay? Um, this is the cloud levels. Now, remember when we talked about the ceiling. Ceiling is the lowest layer of clouds identified as broken, overcast, or vertical visibility, right? So that being said, this is what we're talking about, okay? Few clouds at 9,000 feet, is that identified as broken, overcast or vertical visibility no um, when we say few so skc skies clear means that there's zero out of zero or zero out of eight um, percentage of the sky is clear so or zero out of eight of the sky is clear now, when we talk about few clouds, we're talking one to three eighths of the sky is covered in clouds. Scattered is three to five. Broken is um, I'm sorry, four to one to three, four, four to five eighths then scattered is six to um no i got that wrong one to two is few scattered is three three and four eights um broke oh man holy smokes i'm losing my mind here we go here it is Set it on the next page. I just needed to continue on. So, skies clear or clear is 0%, right? Few is less than 3 eighths. Scattered is 3 eighths to 4 eighths. Broken is 5 eighths to 7 eighths. And then overcast is 7 uh, eighths to 8 eighths for complete coverage, okay? Sorry about that. I really muffed that up. My bad. Um, so anyways, since we don't see a broken or overcast or vertical visibility in any one of these uh, cloud covers, then that means that there's no ceiling. Okay? The ceiling... We're good. Now, if it said BKN, which I'm sure we'll see on one of these reports, BKN, that stands for broken. Okay. And then remember, flight levels are always three digits, and we just add two digits on the end of the number there, two zeros. So 25,000 feet. So this next one. This is our temperature and dew point spread. 
Always read in Celsius degrees, 29 degrees Celsius for our temperature, one degree Celsius for our dew point. Okay. This is what we call our altimeter reading, and this is in inches of mercury. Now, remember, sea level is standard, and uh, sea level, the standard temperature and pressure are 15 degrees Celsius and 29.9 or 2, or 2992. We're almost at standard sea level pressure there, but this is our altimeter, okay? Altimeter is 29.90. Then this remarks section. This remarks section just goes through and just kind of gives us a little more information than our standard line here, okay? Um, now, in this, we don't typically use a lot of the information here, but you do need to understand how to decode a METAR Okay, so the best way to learn is to look at a lot of METARs, but to help you guys along, this page does a really good job of helping you with the remarks section, and I will post it in your lesson plans for today. So this, I recommend that you guys jump on to aviationweather.gov every night and just kind of go through and decode a whole bunch of METARs. Because that's the only way you're going to learn how to decode METARs is by looking at a lot of METARs. Okay? But use this page, use the information on this page to help you get through understanding what the METARs are say okay so like this says automated station with weather or with precipitation uh, discriminator this is our sea level pressure in hectopascals cb is a cumulonimbus distant to the northeast true temperature is 28.3 degrees celsius dew point is 1.1 degrees celsius um Visit, what is it? Visibility. See, this is where I get a little foggy. Vis, no. Visibility isn't being reported. Northwest runway on the northwest runway. Northwest end of the runway. So, visibility isn't being reported on the northwest end of the runway. Or on the northwest runway. So by decoding a lot of these, you're going to start picking up on, on things, okay? Now, let's break down the METAR a little bit to help you guys get through them. So there's five things that are required on a METAR, and you guys need to write these down and memorize them, okay? On a METAR, you have to have... Um, On a METAR, you have to have five, um, there's five required items, okay? The five required items are your wind speed and direction, which is right here, your visibility, your sky condition, your temperature dew point spread, and your altimeter setting. I'll go through them again really quick for you guys. OK, 
Okay, the first one is your wind speed and direction. So this first three digits are your wind direction. The second two are your wind speed. Then your visibility. Then your sky condition. Your temperature dew point spread. And your altimeter setting. Does everybody have that? Does anybody have any questions on that? Nobody? I lose everybody? No questions here. All right. You guys feel comfortable with, would you be able to read the first five things on the METAR? Maybe. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? I can now. So, hello, 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 can you hear me? Oh, yeah, okay. So any questions on the METAR so far? The question I was asking was that they, they usually did, for the most part, they come reading the same format. For instance, the city, the time, uh, the wind speed and direction, it's usually in the same format going yeah. across, okay. Yep, so the five required items for the main body of the forecast will always be the same. The remarks section always gets changed up a little bit. Um, there's still some method to the madness when it comes to the remarks section of a METAR, but um, there could be any random number of things reported in the remarks section. Does that make sense? Okay. So, <clears throat> but but the main body, you guys should, I'm guessing if I were to call on people that you guys would be able to spout off the main part of any of these uh, METARs. And why does the first one, why it has two different sky condition? Uh, you said one is at what, uh, zero nine, Hundred nine thousand feet, and then the next one is one fifty. Why is there two? So <clears throat> it's saying that there's um, three different layers of clouds. Clouds, okay. Yep. So the clouds, there's uh, there's a cloud with base, a few clouds with bases at nine thousand feet. Okay. A few clouds with bases at fifteen thousand feet, and a scattered yeah, clouds. Okay. Scattered clouds at twenty five thousand feet. Gotcha. And what was the next number, the twenty eight oh one? I know that's the dew spread point, but is that like telling you how cold it is and everything? Is that what we're calculating there? Well, we're not calculating anything. We're taking this factually, but twenty eight degrees Celsius is the first two digits are always your temperature. And the second two is always your dew point. dew point. Okay, so always read in Celsius as well. So temperature is 28 degrees Celsius. Dew point is one degree Celsius. Okay. Sometimes what we'll see is a M, an M in front of it. And I can maybe get one of those to pull up really quick. Um, data for that one. Okay. 
I can't remember what Barrows is. Um, K or P. What's it? P. No. I can't remember my Alaska ones. Yeah. So this is the METAR for Barrel Alaska. And you'll notice that the temperature is one degree Celsius, so barely above freezing. Nice warm day for them. The dew point has this M in front of it. Now the M signifies or stand, represents minus, okay? So minus one degree Celsius. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. So remember when we talked about fog, when these numbers get close together, or converge, what do we see at the surface? Condensation. Okay, maybe not condensation, but the air is saturated, and what does that usually mean? Fog. Moist. Fog. Okay, so fog or mist are, are going to be present, right? So this one, it hasn't quite converged yet. And so they're not seeing any fog or mist currently. But as the temperature drops throughout the night, if this dew point remains the same, then they'll probably have fog. Or, or missed in their METAR, so. All right, well, you guys need a dinner break or what are you guys feeling? This is up to you guys. This is the part where I usually get a lot of participation in class is when I ask about breaks. Yeah, we can take one. Yeah. Okay. What are you guys feeling? You guys want a 10 minute break or do you want like a 20 minute so you can run out and grab something to eat really quick? Let's go with the two zero. The two zero. All right. He who spoke first wins okay all right so let's jump back on at um Nine 40, 45 after the hour is everybody good with that perfect good all right see you then
All right. Welcome back, everybody here. I'm back. Well, let's go through some meat tars. So I want you guys to start at the top of the list here and go down. So Christian, you don't have a mic today, right? So Nick... Oh, boy. oh wait what i said oh boy yeah so i'll start with you nick and i want you to just go through to the end of the altimeter so up to that point so this is going i don't know so how far ahead is zulu time ahead of us so in utah here uh -huh. Plus seven. So all you need to know is Zulu time. So you would just say the first two letters here. Yeah. Are the date, and then the last four is uh, that's the time. time. So Zulu time. You don't need to. You don't need to transition no. it to know the exact time. Right. You just need to know that it's zero zero fifty two Zulu, and that's where what time it is in the entire world. In Zulu time, so yeah. so it's, the day is fourteen. It's fifty-two Zulu, zero fifty-two Zulu. I should say. Um, its direction is oh four, and then the knots is four knots. If I'm reading that right. So the way I would read the wind direction and speed would be. Mm -hmm. Wind direction is zero four zero at four knots. Oh, okay. Okay. Zero, you're at four knots, ten statute miles with the. I don't know what the RA is. So that's good because that's. Uh, this is new to what we've been looking at tonight. So these two is. This is what we call a descriptor weather descriptor. So this is rain. RA stands for rain, and if we go into here. You guys will see that all of our possible qualifiers or weather phenomena are all going to be a two-letter identifier. Mm -hmm. So highly recommend that you guys memorize these over the next little bit um, because they will be on tests and they'll be <clears throat> they'll be uh, asked in interviews as well. So. Why so, can't yeah. anything ever just line up? <laughs> so <laughs> RA back to that. Why was why was missed like B something or something, and then why was LPR. smoke F whatever? So F -U. it goes a lot of it is because <laughs> right. So F U is uh, smoke, and the reason why is because a lot of times um, they'll use Latin words, Latin based words. Um, so if it's not something that they can just, you know, doesn't already have an abbreviation, they'll use the Latin term and, and get an abbreviation off of that. So fumer is smoke and BR, I don't know what BR is, but the way that I memorize, well, I don't see another SM <laughs> right on here, but they're right. So, so there, there's possible that they're aviation acronyms. 
Where is my tablet? Where is my tablet? Yeah, Humer is also French, so it's Latin based, right? So <clears throat> the way that I memorize these, and I'll just go through these really, really quickly for you guys, and you guys can take them how you want, uh, memorize them however is easiest for you. But my wife likes to make um, like little sayings um, with the more difficult ones that aren't like easy to translate. So minus is light, plus is heavy. VC is in the vicinity, okay? Am I shallow? That's a question I ask myself every day is, am I shallow? Okay, so I don't know if you guys caught that saying. <laughs> but partial PR, partial. Yeah, see, some of them do pretty good, and then some right. of them seem so freaking random, it just, I don't know. Yeah, and then BC um we use battalion chiefs because we got a lot of uh firefighters in our family so bc stands for fire uh battalion chief and they always wear a patch so bcs are patchy dr doctor takes care of well i better not go into too um descriptive here but doctors <laughs> take care of low drifting objects BL blowing's pretty straightforward. SH showers. TA, TS is thunderstorm, pretty easy. Freezing. Drizzle's pretty easy. Rain's pretty easy. Snow's pretty easy. Snow grains. Okay, those are those little snow pellets that you'll see if it's really cold outside. Ice crystals. It's like uh, freezing rain. Okay. Ice pellets are like really small hailstones. Or not necessarily, I guess, but GR, okay. Um, GR in Green River, Wyoming, they get a lot of hail, uh, hail damage to their vehicles. So Green River hail. I know it's stupid, but it helped me. Um, GS, I can't remember how I memorized that one. Small hell's a grand stone. I can't remember what it is. Anyways, something stupid. Unknown precipitation, UP, unknown precipitation, pretty easy there. BR mist, I just sing the beauty in the B song. BR guest, BR mist. FG fog, FU. Like every time you're sitting around the campfire, everybody's like FU smoke. Because it gets in their face. VA, volcanic ash. Dust. Okay. I know it says widespread dust, but if you remember the dust, widespread comes pretty easy. SA, sand. All my essays come from the sand. Or sandy areas. I don't know. HZ, haze. PY. Um... So like a skunk spray, everybody goes PU, but PY, I don't know. Really stupid how I memorize these. Now that I'm saying out loud, it uh, kind of makes me feel really dumb, but it worked for me somehow. <laughs> PO, um, my parole officer, I don't know. <laughs> I can't remember how I did that one either. Something to do with parole officer and Dustin Fenris. <laughs> so, somehow it connected. <laughs> FC squalls, FC funnel cloud, dance storm, dust storm. Okay. Whatever the 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 main point is find your little niche, find a way to memorize it. Um, one thing that I highly recommend is the app Quizlet on your phones or tablets or computer, whatever it is. Get Download Quizlet and then do METAR decoding and memorize the abbreviations. So it's Quizlet. Huh? Is that Quizlet? Yeah, I'll type it in. 
Why does it keep? So quiz and then L-E-T. And what's really cool about Quizlet is that you can get on there and anybody that's ever made a stack of um, flashcards, you can see the flashcards. So you can just download rather than having to write um, rather than having to write all of your own brand new flashcards, you can just like steal somebody else's and it's not really stealing. Everybody's using the same ones, but you can just pull them off of there and use the flashcards that have already been created. And then you can also add to it too. You can also add to the deck. So if you see an acronym that you're struggling with that they don't have on that deck, then you can always add it to your deck and it just updates yours. So does that make sense? Strongly recommend Quizlet because you guys need to memorize a lot of stuff. All the questions on all the quizzes that you guys have taken up to now and will take in this class, you should probably have those memorized. You should mm -hmm. probably be able to recite those. Um, just a million dollar pointer um, if you want to be a dispatcher because those are typically interview questions or going to be on your practical or oral test. So <clears throat> you should at least have those down. And then on top of that, you know, you should be able to read like Pyreps, Metars, Tafs, any, anything like that. So start building a deck on Quizlet or pulling other people's decks and studying them because it's going to help you out a lot. And there are a ton of dispatch, different types of dispatch flashcard decks. So, and they'll all help you make sure it's aviation dispatch though, not like medical dispatch. So. But there's your, there's your big tip for the day. Okay. Um, but yeah, these are really important to have memorized. I mean, it's important to know the rest of the METAR, but you can kind of stumble through a METAR and, and still pull what you need out of it. Um, but the acronyms get tricky. So, <clears throat> but you guys need to be pretty fluent at reading at least the main body. The remarks section, you, there's common ones that you see in almost every single remark section. AO2, rain began, sea level pressure. This is always precipitation amount in the last hour. This is your true temperature and dew point spread. Those are ones that you'll see in almost every single METAR. You'll see at least one or two or three or all of those in a METAR, okay? So things like that you need to, to have a good grasp on. When you start getting really funky numbers in some of them, it looks like a pretty good weather day out there today. So, but like this one, like, I have no idea what that is. SF2, SF6, that's the first time I've ever seen it. Um, and it's something jacked up that Canada puts in there for some reason, I guess. But anyways, that's those are the big pointers for METARs um, and just general questions, dispatch questions. So download Quizlet, pull a bunch of aircraft dispatch decks off of there, whether it's METAR, deco METAR decoding, TAF, PIREPS, um, NOTAMs, um, whatever, whatever we go over, Jeppesen charts. Um, 
just download a bunch and study them. Do it on your phone so that when you're sitting there on the bathroom, I know it's kind of gross, but when you're sitting there in the bathroom doing something that you can't really get around anyways, and you're going to be wasting time anyways, waste time on studying, whatever it is. That's the time that I'm most focused in. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not trying to be gross, but. Alone time from four four girls. Pretty much the only alone time I get is when I'm in the bathroom. So, anyways, sorry. Okay, I'll let you keep going. You got to right here. So scattered forty six hundred. That forty six hundred, right? Uh, yes, forty six hundred. And then I don't know the. BKN is broken at 7,500, broken at 15,000, and broken at 25,000. And the temperature is 12 degrees Celsius with a, I don't know how to say that, 9 degree dew point. Yeah, you could say it like that. Um, 12 degrees, temperature is 12 degrees Celsius, dew point is 9 degrees Celsius, or whatever, however that flows best for you. Okay. But being able to separate them is temperature first, dew point. That's what's really important. Okay, and then the altimeter reading of 29.82? Correct. And that's the, like, the altimeter is how high they're flying? No. So the altimeter is the pressure. The pressure. Of, yeah. So in inches of mercury... In aviation in the US. Oops. This, um, actually, I'm going to do this. If you guys have ever seen a barometer, so this is an old school barometer. I'm going to pull up. There you go. There's like a really old school Galileo barometer right here. Um, but what they used to do is they would fill a vial with mercury and um, so you have this um, basically bucket and then you'd have a tube that was marked in inches and however high the outside uh, atmospheric pressure pushes on the mercury and pushes it up the tube and however high that mercury got to was measured in inches and that was the altimeter setting. That's the barometric pressure. Does that make sense? There you go. Right there. So that's an old school barometer right there. It was in inches of mercury. <laughs> there you go. So outside air pressure pushes down on the mercury, sending it up to the vacuum tube, and then it's measured. But nowadays it's just like a digital clock, right? Like that. Right. So this gives you in millibars. This is the outside pressure, the air pressure. In metric units, they measure it in millibars. Um, in standard, it's inches of mercury. So that's why you're seeing a lot of millibar stuff here. Because the rest of the world uses millibars or hectopascals. So, anyway, altimeter setting remember the standard um, outside air pressure would be 29.92. Any deviation from that is uh, a change in pressure. And what this is used for is determine, uh, uh, used to determine our um, pressure altitude. So the difference between pressure and actual altitude is what we're 
calibrating for. So when an, when a pilot's in his aircraft, um, like just based off of those three METARs, like the first three METARs you had pulled up there, they're all like pretty close to 29.92. Yeah. And so how often, if that pressure has changed, does that mean they're more or less in a storm essentially or? No. or Not necessarily, just a different pressure. So in the winter, it's the, you know, the standard pressure outside is typically in the 30s. Mm -hmm. In the summer, it's typically in the, like 27, 28, 29 range. Okay, so this is an uh, uh, altimeter that you would see in the cockpit of an aircraft. You turn this knob and you see this window here? That's your barometric pressure, okay? Depending on what your barometric pressure is, that's how this altimeter is calibrated. Okay, inside the, inside the altimeter, you have what's called an aneroid wafer and a vacuum. So this is a static port. Inside this altimeter is, like on the outside of this aneroid wa uh, wafer, is just that standard atmospheric pressure. Inside the, the aneroid, waver, uh, aneroid wafer is um, vacuum sealed. Okay, so as we change the pressure setting in this aneroid wafer, it changes the, uh, the altitude inside our altimeter. Um, and then as we go up and down, it will automatically read the difference in pressure and, and um, tell us what our altitude is. So <clears throat> with this altimeter setting, what we do is when the METAR states 29.82, the pilot will turn this knob to 29.8 and then that first notch is two. So 29.82. And that's that will calibrate his altimeter to the current pressure setting. So now let's let's say that he doesn't change his altimeter and he's at 29.92, but the actual outside air temperature or air pressure is 29.82. That's a difference of a thousand feet. So it will, his altimeter will read a thousand feet higher than what he is actually at. Does that make sense? Yeah. So let's say that his field elevation is 4,227 feet. He's at Salt Lake International Airport, and he's off on his altimeter by 0.1. He hasn't calibrated his altimeter. So let's say that it's, um, he's cal or he's got it set to, oh, I'm sorry, I, I did that backwards. So 29.92 is what he has it set to, but the current outside air pressure is 29.82. Because he has a less dense pressure, or more, more dense. More dense. More dense pressure. The altimeter uh, input in his altimeter, then it will read a thousand feet lower. So rather than forty-two twenty-seven, his altimeter would read thirty-two twenty-seven. Gotcha. Clear as mud. Yep, exactly clear as mud. Well, I understand it. I get it. Yeah. So that's why that is in the report is because when the pilot receives the report that the altimeter setting is 29.82, he adjusts his altimeter to that setting. And these reports, we are giving them every couple so of... they're pulling the report themselves, typically. Mm -hmm. But on the dispatch release, this is part of our dispatch releases. Um, the weather packet right. is attached to our dispatch release. From this, we also use METARs and TAFs for legal legal to go. Right. So, and we'll get into legal to go this week. Sure. So. <clears throat> 
Can you read any of the remarks section? No, nah, I wouldn't be able to do that. I mean, I can see an RMK's remark, the AO2, you said it's standard for I don't know what. Oh, so AO2 is what you'll see on almost 100%, mm -hmm. probably 99% of all METARs. AO2, I want everybody to write this down, is automated weather station with a precipitation discriminator. So that's the that's the type of weather machine that generated this report. It's an automated what? Um, automated weather station with a precipitation discriminator. <laughs> okay. So the precipitation discriminator, what it does is it's able to tell: is it rain? Is it sleet? Is it hail? Is it snow? Is it light? Is it heavy? Is it it goes through and it's able to dis, uh, discern what type of precipitation is currently falling and at what rate. Now, when it's raining or hailing or anything like that, will they always have that dash right there with the abbreviation of what is going on? So if you're talking about this minus sign? Yes. So the minus is light. If there's nothing there, it means that it's moderate. Okay. And there's a plus that means exactly. all right yeah. so we look like sometimes yeah, it's out there so sometimes automated weather center with a what precipitation discriminator okay okay so sometimes what we'll see is we'll see multiple abbreviations for precipitation types so we may see a common one that we see a lot is TSRA. So TSRA would be thunderstorms or rain showers and thunderstorms. Okay. What's weird is that we read first the type of precipitation, then the the weather phenomena. Does that make sense? Right. So Rainstorms or er, rain and thunderstorms. But if there's a minus in front of it, we don't have light thunderstorms. We have light rain and thunderstorms. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Or if it's SH, that stands for showers. We don't have light showers and rain. We have light rain showers. Okay. So always read the precipitation type before you read the weather phenomena. So, like the, so the weather phenomenon will come before the weather type itself is what you're saying? Or this descriptor. So you read the precipitation type before you read the descriptor. <laughs> so it's backwards. It's always backwards. Yep. Three, then two. So you read one, three, two. Gotcha. And then four, five. I'm glad I'm the guinea pig for this. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and you did great. Um, but at the same time, like when I'm when I'm having a student go through it, I'm seeing where I need to improve. To explain or, that. Yeah. So. So, yeah, let's grab the next person in line. Who is that? Let's see. Uh, Terrell. Yellow. I'm sorry, did you skip me before or was I not here? Yeah, I, I didn't know if you had a microphone or not. So Okay, yeah. I got one. I can try it if you want. Yeah, let's let's see you do Houston there. Okay. So that's um May fourteenth at zero zero five three Zulu. The wind is uh from 150 degrees and it's eight knots visibility is 10 statute miles there are two clouds five thousand feet uh, uh, degrees celsius and 
overall setting is 29.91. So it's 10 statue miles, a few clouds at 25,000 feet, 25 degrees for temperature, dew point is 17 degrees, an altimeter of 29.91. Okay. okay, good. Any questions on it or? Um, no. Okay. What's the what's the slope? Is what's the SLP afterwards in the remarks? Is that like their slope? No. So that stands for sea level pressure. So this is the setting in millibars. Gotcha. So this takes the altimeter setting that's in inches of mercury and translates it into millibars. Now the thing about this sea level pressure is we don't read sea level pressure as 132. It's there's always a one that's implied. So sea level pressure is 1132. Unless there's like a nine, if it starts with nine, then it would be 932. So when it, when a, the wind is 150 degrees at eight knots or whatever, right? So that's saying, if you're looking at a compass, that's saying it's roughly what, southeast-ish? Yeah. So, so is that the wind is coming from southeast or going, going southeast at eight knots? Great question. Let's look at a compass. So So here we go. We got a compass here, right? And this is marked out as an aviation compass would be marked out. 360 degrees or 0 is due north, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, so on. Okay, so 150 degrees. That means the wind is coming from 150 going to the reciprocal of 150, which would be 340 degrees. About? No, 300. So it's always listed as from? Yeah, from to. Okay. So when we say the reciprocal, that's the 180 degrees opposite of the direction. Okay. So 340 or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Or actually, this one would be uh, 330. 330. 150, 330. Do you have to ever communicate it that way or just say from 150? Uh, yeah, you would just say winds, wind, wind direction or winds are from one, 150 at 8 okay. minutes. <clears throat> does that make sense? Yes, it does. So that's a, that's a test question. Just heads up on that. So if I say winds are 270 at 8 knots, what, what direction are they coming from and going to? West to east. Coming from west to the east. Yeah. yeah, from the west to the east. If winds are 030 at 10 knots, what is, where are they coming from and going to? Um, Northwest. Do we ever need to be put the like north northwest or whatever, or do, can we just if it's in that quadrant, is it just northwest? So, yes and no. <laughs> the so if you say north northeast, it's a lot more descriptive, right? Well, yeah. I mean, do you sound like you understand the principle better when you use north northeast? Yeah, I suppose you would. Yeah. yeah so. It depends on my audience, right? So if I'm just talking with a bunch of my buddies and I don't have to be very descriptive, sure, I'll just say it's coming from the northeast going to the southwest. Now, if I'm in an interview, I'm going to say it's the north northeast to the south southwest. Gotcha. Does that make sense? Indeed. Casual versus professional. If I'm talking to a pilot on the phone, I'm going to say north northeast. So... It, it it comes off as more like you actually know what you're talking about. Makes sense. So. So this is something else we should obviously memorize or get to know. 
Yeah, get really comfortable and familiar with a, with a magnetic compass here. Um, we're going to get to it in navigation, but the more you know, yeah, the star flying across the screen, the more you know, yeah, <laughs> right, the, the better off you're going to be down the road. Right. So take this picture, whatever you got to do, get comfortable with it. I'll even do a screenshot of it for you guys and put it on your drive for today. It's very polite of you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. There you go. Okay. Does that make wind direction a little more clear and understandable? And, and when I train you guys on the correct way to do it, you guys will learn eventually, you know, the slang or, or how to shorten things up and still be understood. But I want you guys to understand the formal way of reading these METARs because when you get in, in, in into an interview and in, 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 into an interview, you're going to be, you're going to sound a lot more intelligent. Um, and you're going to sound a lot more like, you know, you, you understand it. You don't just, it's not just numbers to you. You understand the principle of why it's being read that way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, and and that's very important in in in, <laughs> in an interview. Okay. <laughs> so one five zero at eight knots. Winds are from one five zero at eight knots. Winds. Any one of those would be acceptable. Winds from one five zero at eight knots. Okay, that's how I would say in any in an interview and it would be very acceptable and professional. So, and that's how I would say it to a pilot over, over a line too. So it's kind of like, uh, I know how to read it and I expect you to understand what I'm communicating to. Yes. So you don't have to simplify it for them. Right. So think about when you're using slang with your friends and then you go and try to talk to, to somebody else. Like you talk to your friends, right? So think of like, sup, bro? How's it going? You know, that may mean something different to the person that you're saying it to, depending on where you're at, right? Um, so clear, concise communication is how we communicate over a line, over, um, you know, over a radio transmission over anything like that um, over a cars that's how we'll communicate is clear and concise and everybody understands when you write it this way what you mean or when you say it that same way they know what you mean now if you just are like in casual conversation and you're talking about a really nasty approach you'd be like you know the winds were coming out of the west at 40 knots and he was landing on runway 32. Whatever it is, you know. But I want you guys to sound like professionals when you get into an interview uh, setting. So, and that's, that's going to kind of be the requirement. <clears throat> Um, as you guys do your weather, weather briefings and things of that nature. So you guys will start, I'm going to have my, the other instructors, um, each morning, we're going to just start out with the things that we learned the night before you guys will read me tars for the first part of class tomorrow, um, just to help you guys understand the principle. Now TAFs are almost identical to a me tar just more vague. They're actually a lot more simple. 
but there's some things that are kind of tricky with a TAF that you need to understand as well. So we'll get to TAFs in a minute. But who did I leave off on? Terrell, are you there? Yes. Okay. I said that right, correct? Is it Terrell or Terrell? Terrell. Okay. Tell me if I say it wrong. <laughs> Slap me. Okay, we did Houston. I'll have you do Dallas. All right, so we at Dallas. Uh, I guess at the time is at what fourteen hundred or oh fifty three Zulu time. We had zero zero five three Zulu. So it would be the fourteenth, fourteenth, fourteenth day, and then zero zero fifty three Zulu. Okay, and then we have our our win, uh, which is at uh, what is that? So the first three digits are your wind direction. The second two are your speed. All right. So what? Fourteen hundred uh, direction, and the speed is oh nine oh nine hundred. So one one four zero for the direction, one forty, and then nine knots. Nine knots. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then we have. Our visibility, which is a ten uh, statue mile, uh, you have we have what two layers, uh, I guess of cloud. Uh, when is that zero? What is that fifty-five? So we always add two zeros at the end of this, uh, at, at the end of those numbers. So a few clouds at 5,500, and then another layer, a few clouds at 25,000. 25,000. Okay. Uh, 2711. That would be what? I'll, no, that's not an altimeter. I don't know what that is. That's the temperature is 27. The dew point is 11. Okay, temperature 27, dew point 11, and then you have your uh, altimeter. At uh, what's that nine 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 or nine or hundred, I guess, and then your remarks. Yep. So altimeter would be twenty nine point nine zero. So that's in inches of mercury, and then down here in our sea level pressure. Remember, we add a one. The one is implied at the very beginning, so eleven twenty one. So that would be our millibar. So remark. Remember, um, a lot of METARs will always have at least these three things, okay? So automated weather station with a precipitation discriminator, sea level pressure 1121 millibars, temperature. This is the true temperature. So the true temperature is red. Um, the first four digits are your temperature. The last four digits are the dew point. So if the first of the four digits is a zero, that means it's a positive temperature. Okay, positive temperature, positive dew point. If it's a one, then that means that it's a negative temperature, negative dew point. Okay, so the first of the four digits in the true the first of each of the block of four so the first and the fifth digit if they are zeros it's positive if one is a one then that whether it's the dew point or temperature is um, a negative temperature so the way you would read this is temp true temperature is 26.7 degrees okay so 26.7, and the easiest way to decode the last three digits of, of each of those blocks of four would be to look at our temperature dew point spread because it's just the rounded true temperature dew point. So 26.7 degrees, 
27 degrees. 11.1 degrees, 11 degrees Celsius uh, for the dew point. Does that make sense to everybody? Yep. Yes, sir. Yep. All right. Good, good, good. Hey, Minneapolis. Who we got next? Brandon. Okay, so it's the 14th day of the month at 0053 Zulu. Wind from 230 at 4 knots. Visibility 10 statute miles. Few clouds at 7,500 feet. Few clouds at 25,000 feet. Um, temperature 18 degrees Celsius. Dew point 1 degree Celsius. Altimeter 2990. Good. Can you read the remark section? Yeah, remark. Um, it's... AO2 automated weather station with precipitation discriminator and then sea level pressure is 11 is it 112.6 millibars no nope. so it's it's in thousands so okay. 1126 1126 and the true um, temperature is uh, 17.8 and the dew point is 1.1 degrees celsius good that was excellent Good, good, good. All right, Nicole. Okay. So it's uh, the 14th day, 0051 Zulu. Wind direction is 70 degrees at seven knots. Visibility 10 statue miles, cloud, few clouds at 8,000 feet, 11, the Temperature is 11 degrees Celsius. Dew point is 2 degrees Celsius. Uh-huh. Altimeter, 2998. Good. Can you read the uh, remarks? Remark section. Remarks. Uh, automated stations with a precipitation discriminator. Sea level pressure, 1152. True temperature, 11.1 uh dew point point two point two good that was perfect great 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 you guys are doing awesome all right jeff it's actually uh chief chief i'm just kidding <laughs> all right so it's the 14th of the month at 056 Zulu. So that's how you say it. Um, wind is coming from 270 degrees at 19 knots. Visibility is 10 statute miles. Um, there's a few clouds at 1,800 feet. Um, a broken ceiling at 20,000 feet. And then the temperature is 15 degrees and the dew point is 9 degrees. And then, let's see, I don't remember how to read this part. The altimeter. Altimeter, is it 30.01? Is that how you say that? Yes, perfect. Okay, and then there's the automated weather center with a precipitation hater. Just kidding, discriminator. Um, let's see. I do not remember what P So So look at it as a whole, PK and WND. Well, it's something wind. I'm just not thinking. So peak wind. Peak wind. Okay. Um, at, oh, so is that saying peak wind um, from 270 at 29 knots? Yep, and that was that this time. Okay. So at 1400 Zulu? I mean, 140 Zulu? Yep, so, so when we see this peak wind measurement... That means that there is a pretty high gust of wind. Right? So 270 at 29, and then it gives you the time that it was measured. And then the, what is the SLP? Something pressure? Sea level pressure. And you said they, that's basically, there's always just a thousand before that. So it's like 1162. Is that what you're saying? Uh, exactly. 
Okay, and then the um, true temperature is 15 degrees, right? And then um, the dew point is 8.9. Great, perfect. I remember yeah. when I first saw these things, I was just like, what the freak? Like, when I very first started studying for the ADX, oh, yeah. I was like, why are there so many, like, why do they use such, like I brought up a minute ago, why do they use such weird letters for everything? Because I had no background in it. You know? <laughs> right. I was like, this is like alien language, but it's making a lot more sense now. So this is cool. Yeah. And it's, it, it is, it's hard at first, but as as you get more and more fluent in aviation uh, speech, <laughs> the more these things make sense and the more, like, you can just look at them and spout them off in, in a half second, you know? So, let's see. Keenan, do you have a microphone? Yep. All right. Why don't you do Seattle for us? Okay, so, it's um, the 14th. At zero zero five three Zulu. It's two six zero at four knot. Um, ten statue miles of visibility. We got scattered clouds at one thousand five hundred. Sorry about sorry about that. I had to okay. tell my daughter to stop screaming in the doorbell. And we have broken at twenty I mean, two thousand five hundred. We got temperature of nineteen degrees Celsius and uh, dew point at six degrees Celsius. Altimeter is uh, twenty nine point nine two. Uh huh. Uh, we got a automated weather station with precipitation discriminator. Uh huh. And the sea level pressure is eleven thirty-seven. Perfect. And uh, that's eighteen point nine temperature. Uh huh. And five point six. Correct. Is that two point? Yep. Uh, just make sure that this one is 25,000 feet. So add the two zeros on there, you get 25,000. Okay. Great. Yeah. Did okay. great. Perfect. All right. Okay, so why is there a speci there? One of the five reporting has changed since the initial Correct. So since 0100 Zulu, one of the five main ingredients of a METAR has changed dramatically enough to where they updated it with what we call a speci or a special report. Okay. So which of the five got updated? You got, well, you got five statute miles versus 10 statute miles. It, it went from a uh, ceiling to uh, not ceiling. Uh-huh. No, actually reverse of that. So this report is after, so 0, 0100 to 0, 126. So this is the updated report. So. Oh, that's it. But yeah, so we went from few clouds to broken at 600. So that's a pretty dramatic change to where, you know, if you got a plane going in there, that may affect their ability to land at the airport. So great. I'm glad you guys caught it. So let's see whose turn is it now. Nicole? Yep. Okay, so uh, Toronto. Uh, so do you want me to read the initial one first? Yeah. And then especially, okay. Uh, so Toronto on the 14th at 01 Zulu, 6 p.m., uh, 0608 knots, five statute miles, light drizzle, mist, few at 900, or uh, yeah, 900, 
overcast at 2000, temperature 08, dew point 07, altimeter 29er, 79er. Uh, remarks, that's that funky Canadian thing. Uh, sea level pressure. When there's a zero there, is there is it is it still the one one on the oh ran away. <laughs> I think he's coming back. <laughs> you said you were too good at it and that you could teach it now. So. No, no. <laughs> Sorry, I got booted out of there. I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden I got kicked out of the class. <laughs> all right, so. Um, you want me to go over? Yeah, so the sea level pressure is red. The one is implied at the beginning. So remember in millibars, it's always, sometimes you'll see a nine. It start with a nine. If it starts with a nine in the three digits, you know that if there was a, that there's never going to be a sea level pressure of one, nine, nine, three. Mm -hmm. So we would, if there's a nine there, we would read it as is. But if there's a zero or a one or a two, then we'll read it as, you know, plus 1,000 there. So. So 1109.3? No, so 1093. Oh, I see. Okay, you dropped that extra. Okay, 1093. Uh, and then the special for Toronto, uh, same day, 14, um, uh, 0126. So. Uh, uh, 626, uh, 060 at 10 knots, five statue miles, light drizzle, uh, mist, um, broken at 600. So sky, sky d came down, overcast, number ceiling at 1500. Temperature 0, 0.07, altimeter 29er, 79er, and remarks in that funky, I don't know what SF. <laughs> That was really weird. Anybody else hear all that noise? Yes, sir. Yep. Still hear it. Nicole, are you okay over there? Is there background noise? There was just all of a sudden like your microphone blew up or something. Weird. Yeah, um, weird. Does it sound better now? Yeah. Oh, weird. Maybe I just needed to reboot. Yeah. Uh, my power cord went in and out. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But anyways, you did great. Um, let's see here. I'm going to add. Got to give everybody a chance, right? All right, so Susan, do you have a mic? I think she says something earlier where she lost, she left the package. All right, sounds good. Okay, so. Oh, Susan, do you have any questions that you wanted me to go over on that before we move on to taps? Okay. So I feel like we beat up METARs pretty good. Taps are, like I said, just a simple METAR. Okay. Um, the main difference, okay, so it says TAF, this AMD stands for amended TAF. Remember what I said about the 00, 06, 12, and 18 Zulu is the normal TAF time. Well, this TAF was released at 0200 Zulu and is amendment from the 0000 Zulu TAF. Okay. So something changed in here where they felt like it was pertinent that they update the TAF. 
Now TAF stands for terminal area forecast, right? So this is a forecast over the next 24 to 30 hours. And the way we read it is just like a METAR right here. It's the 14th day. TAF was is val is 0 200 Zulus when it was released. This is called the valid time. Now this is different from the METAR. In a TAF, we have what we call a valid time, meaning that this TAF is good in from the 14th at 0 2 Zulu to the 15th at 0 6 Zulu. Okay, so this is a 30 hour TAF. Okay. Um, and then we start reading it like we would a METAR. So we would say from the 14th at 0 200 Zulu. Winds are expected to be, now notice how I changed it there just a little bit, expected to be from 300 at 6 knots, greater than 6 miles of visibility. So the P stands for greater than or plus or more than. Okay, so I say greater than 6 statute miles of visibility and few clouds at 10,000 feet. From the FM stands for, for so, question really quick. So on that other one we were looking at, it had the actual minus sign. Do they ever put the plus sign? Not or do they always put P? Yeah, not in a TAF. In a TAF, and remember that when we see that minus sign, that's only going to be on like a precipitation, uh, I guess you would say like a precipitation uh, or a weather phenomena, okay? Gotcha. Um, when we're looking at a TAF, or I mean a METAR, anytime you see 10 statute miles, we can assume that we have 10 statute miles or greater. 10 statute miles is the most I'll report in a METAR. So... That's what that means. In a TAF, they're expecting greater than six miles. So they'll only forecast up to six miles. And then anything greater than six miles, they put a P there. Does that make sense? Yeah, I got you. So this FM stands for from. So this is a forecast from 0 200 Zulu until this next line. The 14th at 0 220 Zulu. So this is a really weird, I'm, I'm telling you guys right now, this is not a typical TAF because typically there are several hours between the, the two lines. So this one is just a, 19 minute forecast. I don't know why they did it like that. But then at 0 to 20, the winds are expected to be from 300 degrees at 11 knots. The G here, you will see this in METARs and you'll see it in TAFs. The G stands for gusting. This is our constant speed. This is the gusting to speed. Okay. So we read this exactly as follows and i want you guys to to really focus on this because this is how you guys will read it from here on out okay the winds are from 300 degrees or expected to be from because we're in a tap expected to be from 300 degrees at 11 knots gusting to 24 knots okay does everybody understand that We don't say winds are expected to be from 24 knots to 11, gusting to 11 knots. That's way wrong. Read it just like a book. 300 degrees, 11 knots, gusting to 24 knots. Constant speed, variable speed. Greater than six statute miles of visibility scattered at 10,000 feet. Then from the 14th at 0330 Zulu, 
Winds are expected to be from 150 at 8 knots, greater than 6 statute miles of visibility, few clouds at 12,000. Then from the 14th at 2100 Zulu, winds are expected to be from 300 or from 300 at 7 knots, greater than 6, few clouds at 12,000 feet. So the from line is simply stating from that time. When we, when we look at this TAF exactly at 0220, okay, we read that as what it is, 0220 until the next line, which would be it wouldn't be 0330 because at 0330 they're expecting it to change to this forecast. So it would be at 0329. Does that make sense? That's the valid time of this line. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Say that one more time for me. Okay. So on these, we call them from lines. Right. This is the forecast from the 14th to zero or from the 14th at 0220 until the next line which would be zero or from the 14th at 0329 zulu because at 330 this is the new forecast got it all right that makes sense thank you yeah no problem now this is probably where dispatchers mess up. I know it sounds simple and straightforward, but that's where when we are determining legal to go and do I need an alternate, this is where dispatchers, this is what causes dispatchers the most grief is, is tax. So um, we will go into legal to go and everything, but Write it down just like that. The from line is from the exact time to a minute before the next line. Okay. Here's another um, acronym that you'll see in wind speed and direction. VRB, what do you guys think that represents? Variable. Variable. Why wouldn't they put a degree in there? Because it's variable degrees that's coming from different degrees. Right. They're measuring the wind is coming from, it's, it's swirling basically, right? Um, it's changing direction rapidly enough, but staying at a fairly uh, constant speed. Does that make sense? What does SKC stand for? Clear sky. Yeah, skies clear, or clear skies. Yeah. Um, let me see if there's anything else that's kind of different. Someone read me this wind report really quick. Coming from 190 with uh, 11, with 11 gusting to 18 knots. No, so 190 at at 11 knots gusting to 18 knots. I know that that sounds silly that I'm correcting it that simply, but it makes a difference. So I like it. There you go. So someone want to grab this one? Wind from 310 at 11 knots, gusting to 18 knots. Perfect. Okay. Someone grab that one. Winds from variable directions at 3 knots. Good. Yep. And that one you could also just say winds are variable at 3 knots. 
but however you feel comfortable saying that, as long as you say they're variable or winds are variable or coming from variable directions at three knots, whatever one of those suits you best, stick with it. This is what we call a one line tap and they're fairly rare because remember it's a 24 hour period. Okay. So in Dallas, Dallas of, of all places, Dallas, they're expecting the wind to stay about this, visibility to stay about that, and the skies to be about that for the next 24 hours. So, so let's look at this really quick. Okay, Chicago O'Hare. From the 15th at 1 Zulu, remember how I was saying that this is the 14th at 1500 Zulu until the 15th at 0059 Zulu? When does this one end? Is it at um, zero, oh, 059? Yeah, really good. So this one we would just go revert to our valid time of the TAF, okay? So whenever we get to the bottom line here, this is this line is only valid until this time, the 15th at 06. Okay. Does that make sense with everybody? Yeah. So that's on every single TAF. 15th at 0400 until the 15th at 0600. And here you go. Here's one of those multiple acronym weather phenomena. It's going to be showers. Yep. You can read it as vicinity showers or showers in the vicinity. Oh, yeah. Otherwise correct. So this is something that you'll see is they'll do two different acronyms on one or they'll combine them into one acronym, just depending on what station's reporting it. But it's common to see multiple weather phenomena in the same line. So light drizzle and mist. That's what how you would read that one. Light rain and mist. Okay. Now here's something you see a lot in Canadian TAFs. This right here, becoming, okay? So in our TAFs, whenever we see this FM or from line, a FM or from line is simply that. It's a forecast, and we call this line a main body, okay? So this would be, or I'm sorry, this would be a main body, okay? When we see one of these qualifiers here, like becoming, we'll also see prop 30 and prop 40. Or we'll also see tempo, um, and I'm trying to think of the other one. But when we see something here, I call them qualifiers, okay? We call this line a conditional language, okay? And what conditional language is saying is sometime between the 14th at 11 Zulu here and the 14th at 13 Zulu, for 30 minutes, there's going to be a change in the main body. They're expecting a change, okay? So this line is valid from the 14th at 0900 Zulu until the 14th at 1500 Zulu. But between 11 and 13, rather than writing its own from line, they put in conditional language saying that for 30 minutes or greater, the winds are going to change to 350 at 12 knots. Okay. Not a huge change from this, but enough that they felt like they needed to add that in there. So it's important to remember these terms. 
main body, conditional language. Hey Garrett, are TAFs automatic or automated, or are they inputted manually? Most most of the time, um, they're automated, but it's not uncommon to have them generated by a person as well. Okay. So. <clears throat> um, so when you're doing your task, are you, you're obviously, you know, you're going to do the main line, but then like all the information, like from the, from at the 24, you know, the different times, are we, are we the ones inputting that or is that just being auto generated as well? What do you mean? So like you have your main line, like where you start with TAF, KLAX, 132339Z, you know, just going through that. And then you got all your froms. Is the TAF generating the froms automatically for the time frame? Or yeah. You so the from line is generated. There's They're expecting a change, a, a significant change from what is in the previous line, what has been forecast okay. in the previous line. All right, that makes sense. Good question. So anytime that – remember, these from lines don't follow this every four-hour nonsense. Right. Okay, that's only generation times. That's not forecast times. Okay, so anytime there's significant enough of a change to require a different forecast line, that's when you'll see a new from line. And it's just a guess. It's a meteorologist sitting behind a computer. I mean, it's a computer generating it, but a meteorologist, the theory behind it is that a meteorologist is saying, sometime on the 14th around 0200 Zulu, I'm expecting the winds to change to 240 at eight knots, visibility to stay the same, but these clouds are gonna go from basically not a ceiling to a ceiling at 2000 feet. Does that make sense? So he's expecting this to turn into a layer, is what we call it. Well, this one to turn into a ceiling or a layer. Okay. So that's METARs and TAFs. You guys will get very familiar with them as we continue through the class because you guys will be reading several of them from here on out. So I'm gonna wrap up this PowerPoint before the end of class. I think there's only like a handful of slides. Oh no, I'm not gonna be able to finish this. But this is exactly what we wanted to go over today, was observations and taps, okay? So, we're going to do okay let's let's pick up from here so we went over metars pyreps we're going to get into remember pyreps are observations that pilots are currently actually experiencing okay <clears throat> so this is this is like Bible doctrine truth right here. Okay, um, we take this very seriously when we get pyreps. We read them as if that's still occurring and that we're going to encounter encounter it if our flight path is in that same area. Okay. SD radar weather reports. Like I said, I've never actually used one or seen really seen them at all. So I think this is something that's outdated. Um, but I may be incorrect, but pretty confident I've never once looked at that. So TAFs, forecasts. Remember, these are forecasts, not observations. Forecasts. This is somebody guessing, throwing a dart at a dartboard. Okay. This is an area forecast. Okay. 
an area forecast. In this one, you don't need to memorize the three times a day or um, 18 hours, good for 18 hours, right? An area forecast is taking a chunk of the United States and saying, I th this is the temperature we're going to see over the next 24 hours, basically. Let's see if it will pull it up. I need to select all these. Now now my area forecast I don't want to pull up. Okay. So an area forecast just takes a bunch of information, throws it out there and says this is possibly going to happen. So SNOPS is valid one hundred or one thousand nine milli millibars. Um, so that's the pressure over PAEH. I'm not sure that's in Alaska. I'm not sure what airport that is, but we'll be um, I don't know and dispit by the end of forecast. Another low over the north pack will stay south of the zones, but an associated trough from low to over. PADQ, I'm not sure which airport that is, will remain uh, stationary. stationary and weaken. Otherwise, high pressure lingers across central. Western Aleutians? Yeah. Something like that. Western Aleutians <laughs> from Anchorage to Juneau. I don't know what that is. Probably is. <laughs> But these area forecasts just give you a big, broad area and gives you a basic idea of what's going on. You want to know the easier way to look at an area forecast than this? I look at surface analysis charts. Um, this is a really good way to look and see what the weather's doing. Um, and you can actually play this too and see where these fronts are moving, the direction of the front, the direction of the pressures, where are my occluded fronts coming in, stuff like that. And then we could look at another chart, like you saw the occluded front up in the northwest, the high northwest. We can look at this, look at the jet stream. Uh, we've got high winds, it's probably going to support the occluded front. We're probably going to see some really bad visibility up in the northwest. And that's a really good way to get a general understanding of the weather situation across the United States is by looking at these surface analysis charts and supporting it with other aviation charts. Now, to get a little more idea, we can go into an actual, you know, area forecasting and, and get a little more of an understanding of what's going on. But... Um, let me see. Um, I don't have access to the. That's an internal website. Actually. Trying to think of the actual 
name of the FAA. Air traffic. No. I think you have to be internal to get it. I can't remember the. Ooh, yes, there it is. Let's see if we can get some info here. Been a while since I've dove into this. Anyways, we have a page where you can actually go in and pull up the uh, all the area forecasts. Let's see, they may have it on here as well. Advisories, aviation forecasts. This doesn't have the textual information with it. Ah. Oh, it looks like they only have forecasts for Alaska right now. Anyways, area forecast, that's what it is. Just really broad information over a large area, okay? Cumulonimbus imply possible severe or greater turbulence, severe icing, low-level wind shear, and IFR conditions, non-MSL heights noted by AGL or ceilings, okay? Air met valid until here. So this is for somewhere in Alaska. <laughs> I don't know the airports in Alaska very well. Um, but that sounds like a really bad weather in that area there. Northern half. AIH. Area forecast. Anyways, that's what an area forecast is, just general information for a large area. Okay, and then these FDs, I honestly don't ever use these. Let's see if they've got them up here. Oh, actually I did use these. <laughs> um, forecast discussions, that's what that stands for. So forecast discussions, this is whether the, the great mines in these regions will come up or will have a phone call, a conference call, and they'll discuss the weather over that region. And then that discussion gets put in a textual form and put on to these forecast discussions, okay? And these are really good because of places like Denver where it's really unique weather and Chicago. Um, in San Francisco and Seattle and Portland and New York and blah, 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 Houston. Anyways, this is by weathermen that live in those areas. It's not a forecast generated by some computer machine that's going to be wrong a hell of a lot, right? This is actually generated by the subject matter experts for that area. So it's kind of a, a really good resource. So especially in the winter, I would go in in the morning and I would look at all of my main hubs and I would look at the weather that I'm going to be expecting for the day. So like Chicago, 6.47 p.m., no forecast concerns throughout the period. A lake breeze continues to move well inland and will dissipate with the sunset. Winds will become light and variable this evening, possibly calm. Winds will become light south, southwesterly Tuesday morning and more south, southerly Tuesday evening. A lake breeze is expected to form Tuesday afternoon, but 
confidence for how far inland it will move is low. It may reach Midway and GYY and remain east of Chicago O'Hare. Trends will need to be monitored with later forecasts. High clouds Tuesday will lower to a mid-deck, meaning, you know, like the four to 6,000 range, Tuesday evening, and there's a chance of a few showers or sprinkles late Tuesday evening. Okay. So subject matter experts came up with this. It's pretty plain to see, plain to understand, and, and you get a really solid forecast over the next 24 hours. Okay. Well, it's actually for the TAF, so 24 to 30 hours. So it says for the 00 Zulu TAFs. Okay. Basically puts a weatherman's confidence in the TAF into a textual form. So I, I liked these. I'd come in here and I'd look at, I don't know why I couldn't remember that this, the FD stands for forecast discussion, but anyways, <clears throat> Um, I would look at these every morning, especially in the winter time, um, before I even start dispatching. I'd go in, look at this chart, look and see where the weather's forming, what I'm expecting it to do, what it has been doing, and then I'd go in and I'd look at what they said about those areas, especially, especially at my main hubs. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Clear as mud. All right, so air mats, sig mats, and convective sig mats. So what you guys need to know is air mats are going to report things such as, and I want you guys to write this down, such as turbulence, icing, um, wind shear and mountain obscuration and surface winds. Oh, and IFR areas of, of instrument flight rules or IFR flying. Okay. Um, six Can you repeat those one fast, real fast. Oh, yeah. So here. You can look at this chart right here. IFR, icing, turbulence, mountain obscuration, and surface winds. Okay, thank you. And only up to a moderate level, okay? Anything that is greater in severity than moderate will be in a SIGMET. But look how broad this region is. So they're saying there's turbulence aloft from Lubbock, Texas, all the way to Minneapolis, and from, what is GLD? Uh, GLD to Topeka in width. Like that's so general that it might as well not, not even put it on there almost. It's air mets are just, Super basic information, and honestly, you just take it with a grain of salt, okay? I'm not going to dump a bunch of extra fuel on a pilot that has to fly through this region um, just because there's an air met that says that he may encounter turbulence. Now, if I have a pyrep or pyreps all over in that air met, that say, hey, there's turbulence, and this is where it's at, then I'm going to make sure that I plan my fl flight accordingly. I'm going to give him hold or extra contingency fuel or whatever it may be to, to help him with deal with that situation. But just because I see an air met that's reporting moderate turbulence from 24,000 to 40,000 in this giant broad area, I'm not just going to like give him 1,000 pounds of fuel. Um, SIGMETs, severe weather, 
Okay, that's what SIGMET stands for, severe weather, and it's talking about icing and turbulence. Okay, so whenever there's severe icing or severe turbulence, that's when we're going to get a SIGMET generated. You guys need to know that one. Just write severe weather. Um, whether that's icing or turbulence. Now, convective sigmets means that it's severe weather with convective. Hey, that's really cool. With convective activity. And what is a severe weather with convective activity? What do we see that associated with? Thunderstorms, updrafts. Thunderstorms. Okay, convective means strong updrafts, right? So thunderstorms are what convective sigmets are for. And this is really cool, guys. You're seeing some really weird radar anomalies on here. And we just talked about this. Isn't that like birds? The, the thing can pick up like birds swarming, uh, like starlets and bugs and yep. things like that. Weren't they talking about that once? Yeah. So we, we kind of talked about this. This is um, not that. Missed that. <laughs> um, these two rings here, um, I want to say, are being generated by um, uh, shadow. What is it called? Oh my gosh. I can't remember what it's called. All of a sudden, it just slipped my mind because I was about to talk about it. That's why it slipped my mind, right? Um, it's a false return, basically. I'm just trying to remember the proper name for it. But yeah, this is just a bad return on it. It's um, oh my gosh, I'm I'm gonna have to look it up and then tell you guys tomorrow. Anyways, so you can see this line of thunderstorms. These. Convective sigmets, you'll see this number alphanumeric um, code next to these boxes. If you were to look up the textual version of these convective sigmets, it would tell you exactly where what the dimensions of these convective sigmets are. Okay, and so convective sigmets equals thunderstorms. Excuse me. You guys good with that? Yep. All right. Do I have to be good with that? Uh, I hope so. If you need me, if you have any questions, please bring them up and I'll do my best to answer them. But yeah, I mean, you kind of do have to be good with them because it's uh, it's going to be you your job, right? You, you can't change it for me? I mean, I'm uh, not with it being that way. Can you change I, it? I, I wish. Hey, Garrett. Yeah. Um, A friend of mine just texted me, said there was thunder snow in New Hampshire. Thunder snow? That's yeah. Cool. You know what that is? <laughs> yeah. So thundersnow, we actually had it in St. George, not this last winter, but the winter before, 2018 winter. Uh, but it is a snowstorm with uh, lightning, lightning activity. Huh. Apparently there's a region right now happening in, in uh, New Hampshire. That's pretty freaking. None, dude. Probably this one right here, huh? Uh. Yeah, let's see. Was... Yeah, the more yeah. I guess there's fifty knot gusts and thunder snow. What <laughs> city? Do you do you know what city she's in? Uh he is in like like northern well, northern New Hampshire, uh Eastern Vermont, up in that. I'm not exactly sure what city it is, but. Um, hmm. 
I'm looking on my weather app and, and there's definitely a, an anomaly up there, a snowy circle <laughs> and a flag with 50 knots on it, but. We can do Concord, Manchester, yeah. Greenville. Yeah. Um, Gonna wanna. Yeah, sorry. I, I was just wondering what thunder snow was. <laughs> no, I want to look it up. Manchester. My friends send me random cool weather alerts. <laughs> it's fun to look up what that is. Yeah. <laughs> I like I like finding things like this. So Manchester, Boston. Regional Airport, Boston Logan. Let's see. MHT. So let's pull up some weather for KMHT. It looks like just light rain right there. Taff, light rain, rain showers. Oh, not LGU, it's K. Let's see what Boston's doing. Yeah, let's just look at Taffs, Metars. Sigmets. All right. Heavy rain, mist. Let's see. Nothing crazy right there. Hmm. What about, uh, let's see. I don't know any of those places there. What about like Littleton or Montpelier? Do you know airport codes? Uh, no, but I can find it. <laughs> Montpelier? Yeah, that. Uh, Montpelier is MPV. Or what about HIE, Mount Washington Regional? Huh? Uh, Mount Washington Regional, HIE. There's a big old mountain there. <laughs> Let's see, okay. We got some, some stuff going on. Like snow, rain. Mm. Yeah, I'd I'm interested to find it. I like finding the really crap weather. <laughs> um, yeah, anyways, I'll have to take a look around. Maybe I can find it by tomorrow. But anyways, yeah. Um, That's interesting. I want you guys, I would like you guys. So I'm going to throw some METAR practice and tap practice up for you guys. But I would really like you guys to also take your own initiative. Um, believe it or not, this is like a college level course um, where your own, own research will also help. <laughs> um, go to aviationweather.gov, okay? And then go to METARS. And then you can come down here and you can type in airport codes. Just go and do ICAO code searches, uh, ICAO codes, do a Google search for ICAO codes, and just start going through METARs. And look at as many, make sure it stays raw, include the TAF, and then get METAR data. 
Okay. If you leave it blank, apparently it gives you a bunch of different airports. But go through and read the METARs. Use your little walk walk through here on decoding METARs, but decode hundreds of METARs because that's the only way you really truly get good at decoding METARs. We can sit here and I can walk you through several METARs, several tasks, but the only way you're really going to get good is if you practice it at decoding them. Um, it took me several hundred METARs and tasks to finally start truly getting comfortable with them. So, um, yeah. I'll see you guys tomorrow. I'll let you guys go now since we're at the end of our time. Um, if you have any questions, you're welcome to stay on for another couple minutes and we can we can go through them. Other than that, we'll see you guys later. Thank you.